it's funny just tangentially um i didn't expect people to actually like dexter because he's a bad guy <laughs> i mean i softened him on, on purpose for dexter um i had some good friends who were miami cops and um the 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 woman was a um, was the model for Deborah. Um, what are my language restrictions on this program? None. Good. Okay. Um, I and I could ask them questions, and they would answer. And they even showed me a few homicide files. They introduced me to a few people. I got the hang of how things work a little bit. And when I was thinking about creating the character of Deborah. Um, and I asked my friend, um, on movies, TV, a lot of times detectives, she was a detective, have, you know, catchy nicknames. Do you have one? And she said, perfect deadpan. Yeah. Einstein. And I said, because you're really smart and you solve all the cases. She said, no, because if my tits were brains, I'd be Einstein. <laughs> and that that part right there went into the character of Deborah and the, the potty mouth stuff. Um, as for Dexter himself, you know, I, the creepy part was simple enough that, you know, he's a serial killer. And then once I had him disguising himself with this job as a for the police department, it sort of became important that he was... He had a, a likable facade so that he could get along and people wouldn't suspect him. And it, it started to work that way. But um, I think the, the very first thing that I deliberately softened him with was in the opening chapter when he says, kids, I could never do kids. And you get the sense that he's killing this particular first victim because he's a predator on children. And that makes people go from ooh to yay. Um, and from from there, it's you know that's just who he was, and it, it developed. It it got new wrinkles and subtleties, but um, he's a serial killer, and he's quite happy with that. Um, and you know he he would kill just anybody except Harry set him on this path, and he doesn't have any sentimental attachments to it. He's a sociopath but it works so he stays with it the miami blood spatter person um told me that he was a little bit too busy to um to talk to me which actually is a um hilarious story of the kind that only happens to me because when the tv show started shooting this same guy spent days with Michael Hall following him around, and he would answer all Michael's questions and all of that. So a few years later, um, at the Miami Book Fair, I was jokingly telling this story. And, you know, I, as a joke, I, I beefed it up a little. I said, and this guy, he even met Michael's Hall, Michael Hall's airplane, and he drove him home, and he hung out with him, and he went and did all this time for weeks which shows you the difference between uh, the popularity of TV and books. Ha, 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 ha. And a hand goes back up, back in the audience. And I said, yeah, question? The guy stands up and says, I didn't meet his plane. And I was ordered to let him follow me around for three days. <laughs> and it was the blood spatter guy. So it's like I can't even tell the story in a funny way without getting busted for it. My original title was the left hand of of dark was was it left hand of God, um, which my editor hated, and he called me and said, "Okay, um, I've been talking to marketing." Now this should set off alarm bells for anybody. Marketing, it's like one of the great curses of our modern age. But he said marketing doesn't like it. Marketing says it, people won't like it, and I said, "Well, I mean, it's my first big book so i'm going okay okay what do, how, how can i help what can i change it to and he said well i have a really good idea it's taken right from the book and i said what is it and he says darkly dreaming dexter 
I said, no, that's that's a that's a terrible title. I I, I hate it. And he said, well, just thinking about it for a few days might change your mind. So try that because marketing really loves it. So um, I thought about it. There was no real alternative. And like I say, it was the first big book. So I called him back and said, okay, I'll go with Darkly Dreaming Dexter. And he said, great. And I found a perfect place to put it into the book. Now on page 243. <laughs> so I got gamed. <laughs> It's mostly um, synthetic humanity. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed about writing his inner dialogues was giving him a stance of being apart from it, you know, a non-human watching human beings and going, wow, that's a very odd thing they do. Why Why do they do that? Um, I like to say it's sort of based on the, the de Tocqueville Things. I think it was called Letters from America, where he comments on the people of America as if they were aliens. And Dexter's doing the same thing. Um, he, he's not a human being in his own mind. And he's seeing them do all of these weird things and going, why do they do that? Because <laughs> uh, I don't feel the impulses that made that happen. Um, so his relationship with Rita... Uh, was sort of, I sort of need this cover. It's like, you know, back in the day, gay people had to have a beard sometimes. And so really Rita started out as Dexter's beard. Um, uh, he did grow attached to the kids, which I guess was another softening thing. It works hand in hand with my original title, The Left Hand of God, um, because only one reporter in, in all these years has, has asked me this. Um, his question was, were you making a pun with Left Hand of God and Dexter? And I went, you must have had Mr. Bowden too. <laughs> uh, yes. See, Dexter, of course, is right hand, dexterous. When we say dexterous, we mean you're right handed. Um, and the left hand is sinister in the old days. Um also meaning bastard in the old days. Um, so that was just sort of a complicated pun. Uh, he was the left hand of God, and he was Dexter. Uh, so that's the name stuck because, you know, um, it kind of works. I don't know why. It's one of those, it's almost like poetry. When the sounds are right, it doesn't really matter whether you think that they make sense. It feels right. I was fascinating um, to me was the idea of a con man uh, and someone who was a master at disguises and would use these disguises to worm his way in, as I did in the first book, Just Watch Me. Uh, what he did is really horribly cruel. He makes a woman fall in love with his disguise persona and uh, in, just in order to rip her off. Um, and that kind of fascinated me. Now, I was working with a new editor, and he said, well, con man is okay, but you need to make um, something more of it, add a few more dimensions. And he was very helpful in developing the character, and we finally came up with, okay, he's the greatest thief in the world. The con man is one aspect of it. Um, and he also doesn't mind killing to achieve his goals. Uh, particularly if it's the 0.1% of the uh, overprivileged asshats, as he calls them. Um, he has a real grudge against them. Um, the first book, Just Watch Me, sort of does some background on that. The real plot point of um, Fool Me Twice is stealing a fresco. <laughs> and if you know what a fresco is, um, it's something where they, they put a wet plaster on a wall and then paint into it, and you have to get the full painting in before it dries. But once it dries, the fresco is a part of the wall. It's it's the wall now. How are you going to steal a wall? And just for fun, I put the wall in the Vatican, which however else you may feel about the Vatican and Catholicism, they have really, really good security there. Um, so for me, that was the most fun. Um, to take something that impossible and make it plausible. So I talked to uh, a, a really good chemist, 
uh, who said, well, I'm not sure if this work would work, but it could work. And he provided the solution for how to steal a fresco. Um, so that's always been my rule. Um, plausible, even if it's not probable. It's again, he's doing this unforgivable thing of disguising himself um, as someone that uh, our main villain has to love. In this case, it's it's a son he didn't know he had. Um, and getting away with it under impossible circumstances. Now, all the hostages, from the beginning, from the first two books, we know that Riley's mother is very important to him. And she's been in a, however you want to call it, non-responsive state or coma or vegetative state for years. But he spends a lot of money keeping her going in the hopes, in the belief that someday uh, they will find a way to bring her around. And um, so someone, um, an intelligence officer, um, finds out about this and takes her as a hostage to get Riley to do something awful um, and impossible, which is, the whole thing about Riley is if it's not impossible, he's not interested. Um, and in this case, uh, the lighthouse is um, its uh, an in incredibly heavily fortified uh, fortress. It's guarded by some Russian Spesnots, Special Forces troops, ex Spesnots, and it's got every conceivable um, electronic and other security device. And the lighthouse is actually just um, disguising a Russian missile silo from the Cold War, which has been converted into living quarters and so on. And that's where the bad guys hang out. And the vault is with the thing that, Rush that Riley has to steal. So he has to overcome all of this amazing security and then open a vault, which is um, impossible. <laughs> um, and one of the fun, fun side benefits of doing Riley is learning things like, what are modern vaults really like? And I, I got to learn all about the different layers that go into making an impregnable vault now uh, and how each one will defeat a different kind of attempt to open it or crack it open. And um, it's a lot of obstacles, and I lay them all out very well because um, Riley has to defeat each one. So that's part of the fun. And then escaping and getting the hostages back, which I will not spoiler or spoiler alert there, um, becomes really important. And the three-edged sword, the title comes from the fact, um, you know, we say a sword can cut two ways. And in this case, um, Riley felt it cut three ways and hurt him deeply with each cut. Um, one of my favorite things about it, there's an old British expression, which I use in this case. Um, when you learned a hard lesson, um, the old Brits used to say, well, that's another wrinkle in my ass. Um, so Riley was like, I didn't just get a wrinkle. I got three cuts. It hurt that much, but I've learned it. And that's where the title comes from. The fourth rule is um, Riley in love, which is very uncomfortable for him. He always avoids even making friends, really. He has one or two, but um, they're weaknesses. As we saw in the, in the previous book, if someone finds out about them, they can be used against you. Um, so that's kind of fun. And... Just as, as a bit of a lark, um, he decides with his new girlfriend to steal the Rosetta Stone from the British Museum, um, <laughs> which uh, it is, this is getting to be overused, but it's impossible. <laughs> um, and I learned some fun things there, too. I love doing the research for this book for a first time. Um the Rosetta Stone, as you may know, is actually, it's it's Egyptian. It really should belong to Egypt. But when the Egyptian government finally got around to asking the Brits to return it, they did the simple heartwarming gesture 
of sending back to Egypt a full-scale fiberglass replica of the Rosetta Stone. And I love that. <laughs> so learning little tidbits like that keep the, uh, keep the day moving along.